Well, here we are, Last Minute Blues Podcast, live, out, and about today. We are at Twin Peaks uh, in Brentwood, and uh, we are here to watch some uh, to watch an amazing amount of sports with all the TVs on here, great food, great drink, and I am joined by the one and only Mr. Jamie Rivers. What's up, homeboy? Uh, nothing, just enjoying the old 29-degree man-sized draft here, Donnie. My Dude, goodness. that thing looks cold and delicious. It Everything is. about it. No lying. That's for sure. It is cold and it is good. I would really like the opportunity to do the podcast out uh, and about more often uh, because. Are you allowed out? I mean, Mary keeps you on a pretty tight leash. Sure, sure. But if it's arranged correctly and ahead of time, absolutely so. Oh, you guys have that arranged. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just no, not not particularly. I guess just why do you always got to trip me up, dude? You said it. I just asked you. I know, but it's great to be out here today, and it's fantastic um, to be here with you. And I I love when we get the opportunity to um, to not only talk about what's going on with the Blues currently, but also you know, man, there's so many great stories in which that you have told me over the years, on air, off air, that. Um, I feel like they're such great stories that maybe we don't get back to them enough to remind people how freaking crazy your career (laughs) has been at times. So I want to get to some of those um, things as well. Sure. But I think the logical place to start is our St. Louis Blues right now, as we stand 20 some odd games, the old state of the union into the season. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't blame you. I feel like there's a lot of people that are maybe upset or are not happy with the direction of this team or where they're at right now. And I would love to get your read on it because to me, man, I kind of feel like we're seeing what we thought that we would see. I, You know, like we're going to get some good, we're going to get some ugly, and we're going to be learning along the way. You know, we I, I don't think very many of us went into the season thinking that this year was going to be a Stanley Cup run. What, what do you think, boss? Yeah, so the way I look at it is this is kind of what I expected. You know, Doug Armstrong was pretty blatantly obvious with what he said to Blues fans and Blues Nation, we'll call it. He just said, look, you know, we're going through a retool phase. Uh, Unfortunately, he had to trade off some names that everybody loved for a long time. Some guys that won a cup here, guys that were character guys. But they were, you know, the contracts were up. They weren't coming back. So how do you transition into the next phase of the Blues? Because you have a big portion of your team that has long-term contracts, a lot of money committed to it. And the other portion now is moved on or they're younger. Yeah. So how do you get to the next phase of what the blues are? You're going to have to have a little bit of a retool. And I think army was, was really smart with it. Picked up guys like Kapanen and Verona. And then the off season got Kevin Hayes, like Braden Shen is now your captain. Scott Perunovich is making strides in the right direction. Tyler Tucker looks good. So this is kind of what I expected from this team. Yeah. I mean, as it sits right now, we're in the playoffs. And I know that there's a lot of Blues fans that were really, really upset last year with the team not making the playoffs, me being one of them. Yeah. So the fact that this team right now is able to be in a playoff spot 20 games into the season, that's a positive thing. Yeah, 100%. So I think it's curbed the expectations just a little bit. I don't think we're ready to order the rings. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But at the same time, this is not a dumpster fire. And I think that what people are seeing are some games where the team looks really, really good and other times when the team doesn't look prepared or they're not competing enough. But this is some of the growing pains you're going to go through when you have a retool, this yeah. is the blending of the older talent and the younger talent kind of finding their middle ground. You know, so um, one of the things that um, <laughs> we have been very fortunate over the time to do this podcast and, uh, w- you know, obviously Jeff is not here with us, you know, this year to kind of uh, to, to carry on. But um, I often like am sitting watching a game thinking to myself, who would Jeff be geeking out over <laughs> that you would be going, hey. Reality check, my man, <laughs> i.e. his absolute fascination with Clem Costin. Yeah, the old Clem Shady. So so much so that when Clem Costin got traded to Edmonton, I was still following him because whenever he would do something great, I would just think about, you know, I would think about Jeff. And so I'm looking yeah, at this. Clem Costin became like Cam Neely in Edmonton. Oh, oh my what the God. hell happened there? <laughs> Dude, but, where were you hiding that? Right. We need we could have we could have used that. But I, I kind of I always am thinking like who would Jeff be gravitating towards? Who would his like man crush be on this blues team? And also too, just like um and and 
I know you, you know, watch the game in a different way that Jeff and I do, but like we would text during the game so much that last year when I wasn't texting with him during the games, it just wasn't the same. You know what I mean? Like there was just something about that goofball yeah. coming out of nowhere with something, whether it be a love of a player, a hate of a player, a, a wacky, you know, like like look at things. But he is just, uh, boy, I just miss the crap boy, out of that dude every day. Obviously miss the heck out of that guy. But I'm a little offended that you guys used to have this little text string going on <laughs> and you didn't include me. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Like what? I feel a little bit like I was being cheated on. I'm oh, not gonna lie. Dude, and okay, let me tell you something. If we would have messaged you, you wouldn't have messaged us back anyway. So it wouldn't have so well, it wouldn't have mattered. So what? <laughs> it's just like when you tell your wife something, she you know, she doesn't respond. You're like, but if you don't tell her, why didn't you tell me? And I then, should... Donnie, what it is, let me be the judge of if I like it or not. All right. I, right? I, Where I have guess... you heard that before? Who, Probably this morning. Who who on this team would be our dude's guy? I, I'm thinking about that. I think Casperi Kapanen. You think so? His guy. I Tell think, me why. Well, because he's got tremendous amount of speed. Yeah. He's pretty gritty out there. He's kind of like Jeff liked the guys that were somewhat under the radar. Yep. He, he didn't pick the obvious star. Right, right. And he didn't pick the, the obvious tough guy. He liked kind of the blue collar guys. His Bob Basson. You know? Oh, gosh. I forgot his love of Bob Basson. Love? It's an infatuation. You're right. It's oh, an my gosh. I totally forgot about that. Dude, we would go. We would not go two podcasts back to back without a Bob Basson reference in there somewhere along the if way. If we go back, I bet you there's a subtle Bob Basson reference every single frigging podcast. Every single one, man. Yes. So the only other time in which that we got to do this, where we got to broadcast and do the, the podcast live, is uh, we were out with Brett Hall, and it was, and I don't know where it was in Jeff's sickness. But he was hurting that day, man. He was not in great shape. But like he did with us every time, dude, every time he would come in ready to go. Well, we used to give him crap. We're like, dude, what are you doing? You're just the hospital this morning. Yeah. You missed half your own show because you couldn't do it. Now you're here doing the podcast. But then he'd he'd kind of throw it back at us and say, well, yeah, this is helping me get through some of this. I love doing this podcast. I love talking blues and love hanging out with you guys. And so, you know, not that we became part of his therapy, but we kind of did. Yeah. And to your point, looking back at, you know, some of the pictures from that day, like he really toughed it out. Like you talk about playing hurt, like this guy epitomized it. Dude. And I mean, and he did that so much for us towards the end. And I was so like adamant about like, yo, man, stay home. Don't come to work. And I didn't realize until much later, like, yo, he like needed that sort of thing. Did, man. Yeah. So that's why, like, uh, you know, when when we do the, the intro of the podcast, the, the outro of the podcast, we're always going to include Jeff as, as long as we Absolutely. do this, because he will always be a, uh, a member of our. Well, he's group. also the founding member. Yeah. This was Jeff's crazy idea. Yeah. Let's go back. Let's be real here for a minute. I'd, I'd have to even think about it. I mean, I'm sure I don't. Oh, I remember you. the freaking moment. Yeah. Because this podcast got its name because it was literally at the last minute before yeah. I was going downtown to do TV for what was Fox Sports Midwest at the time. Uh-huh. I had jumped on uh, that spring with Anthony Stalter on the turn midday, just kind of helping out. And the Blues made the playoffs. And then Jeff was like, hey. We should do a podcast. I was like, hey, great idea. Yeah. Let's do a podcast. He's like, no, like today. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, no, he goes, I think it'll be awesome. Let's get a podcast and people can listen on the way down to Enterprise Center. So I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And did we? he, he must have grabbed you in a headlock. Yep. And uh, he didn't have to do much convincing, dude. We we're off and running. And he goes, I go, well, what do you want to call it? He goes, like, I don't know, like last minute blues podcast. And it's kind of a play on words at the same time. Yeah. I didn't think about it. I'm like, okay, sure. Whatever you want to call it. I don't really care. I don't even know if you know this or not, but but Jeff kept me from absolutely going crazy on our imaging guy because originally, okay, so listen, and this is a stupid thing that I get mad about, but I get no, mad about you. stupid things. I know. Not you. So we had an intro to the podcast that said, "What well, you're listening to the last minute blues. And he did not put podcast on the end of it. Because he thought that it would be redundant to say last minute blues podcast when it's a podcast, when it's a podcast. Yeah, fine. Okay. 
but it's not your podcast, Jack. How's your heart rate right now? Yeah. Well, it's fine, but it still <laughs> drives me crazy. And then, like, as this is going on and I'm getting madder and madder, Jeff is thinking that it's funnier and funnier, the matter in which that I'm getting. But, like, I just could never let go. And I think for probably, like, the first year of our podcast, it drove me nuts when I heard the but intro. But we did change I, it. No, he fixed it, but he fixed it after the boss told him to fix it. Well, I remember I, I having a vote in this, and I was like, yeah, call it Last Minute Blues Podcast. I don't care if it's redundant. Right, because if the intro just said "Welcome to the Last Minute Blues," it would be stupid. If you think you're playing the blues, bomb, bomb, just, bomb, yes, bomb. it would just be awful. And I can't even believe that like that got out of the idea stage. Like somebody doesn't just go, "Hey, this is bad." No, we're not doing it. That Donnie, way. some of those voiceover guys, yeah, or like Ron Burgundy. I get it. You just read what they put in front of you, buddy. Yeah, I get it. I I absolutely get it. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the Blues, obviously, so far, where we think that they're at this year. Uh, there's a couple of things that I want to bring up. Um, specifically, the first thing that I have to bring up, and I hate to do it because we're having such a nice time. What? Is the Blues power play. Um, it Ooh. is. Um, and I think- You know, Donnie, in the last 10 games, the Blues lead the league in high danger opportunities on the power play. Well, that's cool, man. But the power play looks cherry pick. <laughs> but the power play looks like garbage, even to those of us that hey, don't necessarily hey, know hey. what the X's and O's look like. Why are you gonna be like that? Because I think the power play is six for thirty-six they had on four the year. Shots on net and three power plays. What more do you want, <laughs> dude? <laughs> Thank you. I, at least now I know that the people know that you're being sarcastic, but dude. Like for for real, like. They get the four minutes last night. It, it seems like they get even nothing going on. Well, that was on. a problem. So the first the first period, they had a couple of power plays. And I was talking with Scott Mellenby, who happened to be the, That's a name drop. Okay, you can mark Very that good. I like it. And I, I thought they were zipping it around pretty good. Good speed to the passes, effective tape to tape. They had a couple of set plays, a little pop-out pass. Buchnevich almost scored a goal. So I thought, okay, this is effective. You didn't score, but you generated chances. You put the other team on their heels, which at the end of the day, it wears down a team. You mm-hmm. want to, The more you can make a, de- a team defend, you're winning the energy battle mm-hmm. because it takes twice as much energy to play defense. It's crazy how that works, but it's a true thing. But then the four-minute power play in the third period, and I said this on the broadcast last night with Valleys, is I said, you can't sit back and – eat up the whole clock, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to operate with urgency because the biggest mistake that power plays make when it's a four minute or a five minute power play is okay. We've got time, move the puck around, move it around, take our time. No, there needs to be urgency. It, 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 what I always wanted to do as a player. And when I coach is one minute power plays is what I call them. You want to generate a goal or great scoring opportunities within one minute. So if you have a two-minute power play, you should have a, a one. The first minute should be getting scoring chances. The second minute should be getting scoring chances too. On a four-minute power play, it's the same thing. It's like you have four one-minute power plays, and you have to act like after the one minute, time expires. You're done. And when you do that, you play with more urgency. When you do that, you play with more intensity. You retrieve pucks more. You put more pucks to the net. And I didn't, I didn't feel. No, I, I didn't feel. I know the Blues didn't do that in that four-minute power play. And that's what I was afraid of. Yeah. So they've got to get a little more urgency in their game. But we did talk to Craig Berube today on the fast lane. And he did he did throw us that stat of having the you know the most high danger opportunities in the last 10 games. But it's important as a coach, you want to be able to build with your guys. Can you imagine just sitting there and just kicking them in the balls over and over and over again? Absolutely. Like it might be fun to do it, but it's not fun for the players. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. And so when you're the coach, you have to find positive things to build off of for your team because the first part of the, the season, the power play was not very good. Right. Now, in the last five games, and they've got three goals on the power play, I think. Could be wrong, but I know they definitely have three. It might even be four. I'm not sure. You can fact check me later. Plus, it's being recorded, so I could be right. Who cares, right? <laughs> can go back and edit it out and post after the nah, fact. We don't edit anything. Mistakes are funny. Right, right, right. So what do you see? I mean, it, there's not a quick fix to this. Really. There is. Absolutely, there is. I think you juggle up the power plays. You get a lot more of a shot first mentality. You get guys like I would love to see Robert Thomas on his offside. He's playing on his strong side right now, which I know he likes it because he likes to hit that seam pass, which we saw to Pavel Buchnevich against the Chicago Blackhawks. 
But when you're on your offside, he can move the puck down low quickly. He can move the puck to the middle bumper guy quickly. He can move it to a one-timer Tory Krug, or he can take one step to the middle and drive to the net and shoot the puck himself. So he's got four options being in the one spot, whereas in the other side of the ice, he's got one option available. And the other option's a shot, but everybody knows, like, that defenseman fronts the puck. It's like, remember when Vladdy, we get a little frustrated with Vladdy on his strong side? Yeah. Because he'd hang out of the puck, and then everybody this side of the Mississippi knew he was going to shoot it. Right. So the defenseman just blocks it, gets a stick in there, or they take the shot lane. This is kind of happening to Robert Thomas right now because it's it's slow evolving. It, you just can't cradle and shoot very quickly sometimes like a one-timer. Sure. So that's why I'd like to see him on the offside generating some chances over there. And then I'd like to see a power play where we mix it up, like Jake Neighbors in front on one power play, Braden Shan on another. I like Tory Krug, what he's doing right now, because he's shooting the puck more. And the other unit, look, Scott Perunovic is the future of the power play. But not right now. Mm -hmm. Not right now. He, he does a great job of walking the blue line. He finds great passes. But I want Justin Falk up there just hammering pucks. I know everybody wants Colton Pareko, because Colton Pareko shot the puck 105 miles an hour. It is impressive. Trust me. Do you know who has a higher velocity than Colton Pareko per average? Justin Falk. Really? I did not know Justin that. Falk shoots the puck anywhere between 96 to 100 miles an hour on a regular basis. And, and Justin Falk has a, a better idea of where that laser beam is going. Is that also yeah, true? Yeah, but the argument you made right now, Colton Pareko scoring some goals. He's doing a good job. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, this is, it, by no means is this a Colton Pareko like doesn't belong in the power play. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more of a Justin Falk might be a better fit for that second unit. And now you've got a couple of guys that are loading up the shot, getting it on net. In fact, I don't even care if you go with Perunovic and Falk on that power play, to be honest, because Perunovic likes to move the puck. He doesn't like to shoot it as much. So you get a couple of guys, maybe Verona on the one-timer, Falk on the one-timer, and then you load up the middle of the ice. Put two guys, put Sunquist and Blay in front of the net. I don't care. Right. And just moving it around that triangle up top, and whoever becomes available hammers that puck, and you got bodies in front. I love your nickname, for Sonny, for Oscar Sunquist. Junkyard dog is the exact, I mean, <laughs> dude, that is exactly perfect. Like, and also too, and I'm thinking about this because Junkyard dog was one of the first wrestlers that I absolutely loved in the WWF. You liked the collar, didn't you? Dude, I thought, I just thought he, him, I'm upset. dude, he would, he would bark at his opponents for the love of God. All right. So like, I thought to myself, like, this has got to be high praise. And then I go, you know what? That's absolutely right. Sonny is exactly that guy. I'm so stoked. And I know we've talked about it on the podcast, and he is much loved. But, boy, I love seeing Oscar Sunquist wearing a blue note, dude. Well, I, I was trying to think of something to reference when you're talking about Oscar Sunquist because it's difficult to encapsulate. That's a big word. Okay, it is. One. Well done. It's difficult to encapsulate what he is and what he does for your team. Then I'm watching him, and I'm like, okay, so a junkyard dog, you look in there, very seldom do you know what kind of breed it is. You're like, I don't know what the hell that is. Uh -huh. But it also looks grumpy. Mm. It looks beat up. <laughs> it hasn't been washed. You're like, mm, I don't know if I want to mess with that junkyard dog. Right. It might have a nail sticking out of its paw. Like, who knows, <laughs> right? That's Oscar Sundquist. Yeah. Oscar Sundquist takes a beating. He took a butt end in the face. Not too long, a couple of games ago, he took a stick in the face. Two games ago, he took another one last night for four minutes, took a shot in the back of the ankle. Like, he's just that junkyard dog that is there, and you can't get rid of him. He's just such, and I mean, he is just go, 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 go. There is never a time that he is out there lollygagging, as it were, man. No, and this is what you wanted to do when you wanted to reset your culture for the team. Because last year, you know, there was a, a period of time where it felt like this team doesn't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you make those trades. And then I actually felt like the team trended upward. And, and they did, for the mm -hmm. most part, defensively, all these categories, effort, compete level, they trended upward. But when you bring a guy like Oscar Sundquist back, you already know what the bar is. Like, you know, this guy won a Stanley Cup. He was a, a pivotal part in that championship run. And he shows up to the office every day. And he's doing, he's willing to do whatever the hell it takes to win the hockey game. And that's what, that, so what are you going to do? You got a guy like Oscar Sundquist, who's a Stanley Cup champion, doing all these things. Are you going to sit there and say, "Well, I can't do those things"? Yeah. No, you're not. I mean, that dude is. Bleeding if you're not, like then you don't game. play. Right. Right. He's just man. He is just quickly becoming too like St. Louis's favorite son. <laughs> like all of a sudden, Sonny is everywhere. Well, he loves it here. Yeah. He, even though he was traded 
to the Red Wings, and then he went on to the Wild. Like, he still had a place here. Right. It was kind of funny because it was like, where's Sonny? It's like, where's Waldo? Because <laughs> you'd open up social media, and all of a sudden, Oscar Sundquist is somewhere random in right. St. Louis. Oh, wait, he's at Soulard for the, for the, for the, like, the dog races or whatever the heck that yeah. it was uh, during Mardi Gras. That's so great, though, when you see players like that. And we get to see it a lot of times with the Blues, like, where you see them gravitate towards the city and stay in the city. Like, it's just you know, man, it just goes on to prove what we all know is that there's something very special uh, about our town. So we have, geez, man, there's a, a ton of stuff in which that we can talk about. One of the things that I want to get your, um, your handle on here, um, the athletic gives the blues an 11% chance oh, to make gosh. the playoffs. Why as of talking two, about the athletic as right of two days Jeremy ago. Rutherford, I love you. <laughs> But, but I, your buddies at the athletic have been sipping on grandpa's cough syrup a little bit. 11% does seem very low. They're in the playoffs right now, right? And if you look at traditionally the NHL playoffs in recent history, anyways, the Thanksgiving day is the mark. And there's like only 11% of teams that are in the playoffs at Thanksgiving don't end up making it ultimately. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why they would have that kind of a percentage right now for a team that is hovering above 500. Right. In a conference that's struggling overall, you have you have the haves and the have nots right now in in the Western Conference, and the Blues are right there where they're not quite a have, but they're certainly not a have not. But you look at the bottom feeders like Edmonton struggling; they've won a couple in a row now and whatnot. But Edmonton, Calgary, not great. You go down Arizona; who knows what the hell they are? Chicago is what we thought they would be ultimately. Connor yeah. Bedard's a nice piece, great going. A little couple of issues going on there with Corey Perry and things like that. But you know, um, I think the Blues are in a playoff spot right now, and I think they're going to stay there. They they might hover in and out of there, but I think ultimately at the end of the season they get in there. I understand that we have to be very very careful. Why? Yeah. But. It's a the podcast. We do the hell we Dude, want. <laughs> the last 24 hours of hockey Twitter has been absolutely flipping insane. Explain, Donnie. What Dude, do you mean? It, it, I mean, so <laughs> I, I get a message from uh, somebody in the Urge, and he's like, hey. You can name drop. Go ahead. Okay. Well, it's Jerry Joe's the guitar yeah, player yeah. extraordinaire, badass man, and a big hockey fan. Hey, uh, why don't you uh, go and search uh, Connor Bedard, oh, boy. Cor C Corey Perry. And I say, okay, man, I, ba, 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 ba. oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So first and foremost, okay, and I want to take this, like, I just feel do whatever so, you want with it. Dude, I feel so sorry for this poor kid. Yeah, it's brutal. Like, I feel so sorry for him. Like, I don't know what happened. None of us really know what happened. But like, well, I have a pretty good idea. I'm sure in which that you do. But if that story is not true, I mean, but even if it is this poor kid, Oh, my yeah. God, I cannot imagine the chirping. Like, I could not imagine the chirping. So let's start with this. The only reason that that got started was because people Googled Connor Bedard's mom. She's an attractive woman. Okay. And so they tried to put two and two together and be like, oh, okay, like, why would Corey Perry, you know, and then they just came out the mom's trip not too long ago. Like, people are really reaching. Yes. I'm going to say this very firmly. The rumor about that is 100% false. It never had any substance to, substance to it. It was never true. And what I hate about it is that it's funny for the internet. Like, trust me, I giggled my butt off at some of the memes and some of the things and some of the little videos. Hilarious. But then you got an 18-year-old kid who has been in the spotlight, like to say the least, like internationally he's got cameras in his face every single day he's trying to perform he's trying to play hockey and now you get this dumb rumor started and you've got to try and sit there and not address it because it's so ludicrous that you know you don't want to even give it life and you're trying to play hockey with a tremendous amount of pressure on you with expectations through the roof which was already there anyway before yeah. all of this crap happened it's just it's unfortunate that somebody that so that's the power of social media in a dangerous way of course yeah is that stuff like that doesn't get verified and it's tough because you could never verify that without diving in and then the blackhawks totally disclosing what happened which they're not going to but to my knowledge it's an employee of the team that had contact with Corey perry not a mom not a this yep. not of that and 
you know, I don't know the, the all of the information regarding it. I'm not going to get into it because, you know, yeah. I don't want people say, oh, you got this wrong. No, but the, the crux of it is, is that it was an employee fraternizing with a player. All right. So if you are in the brain trust of the Chicago Blackhawks, this is happening. Don't right you now. ever wish that upon me. I, I would never <laughs> wish that upon you. You know me and I would never do that. <laughs> but yo, man, like this is the future of your organization. And then, oh, on top of that, this is a young man that's still growing, still maturing. How in the world do you handle this situation from here on out? Well, the Blackhawks could screw up a ham sandwich. I'll tell you that much. Sure. Like, unbelievable how poorly they have handled things in the last little while. Yeah. But this, they didn't have, like, when they when they removed Corey Perry from the lineup and there were so many question marks, they didn't have to be so obscure with things. Well, he's been removed for reasons that are hockey. What the hell does that mean? Sure. So now people go poking around and like, well, what's going on here? Let what the did speculation he do? begin? Did he, did, was, he, was he drinking too much? Were there narcotics? Were there this? Like they really go diving for the worst case scenario. And the Blackhawks let it kind of breathe. They, they, they gave it life a little bit by not addressing it head on. And then it got to the point where, then the Connor Bedard rumors started, which were asinine, but they still never addressed it right away. Yeah. And then even in their addressing of the, you know, waiving him for purposes of termination of contract, they still didn't really clarify things. And I understand there's probably legal reasons to the latter, the last part of it, where the termination part. Sure. But man, there was nothing that says you can't get out ahead of this and be like, listen, it has nothing to do with any of his teammates or their family members. Man, I mean, just a, just an absolutely bizarre. Well, imagine being 18 years old, you're in a locker room, you have to walk in the next morning and all of this stuff is all over social media. And then also too, let's be honest. I want to be very honest. If you are in the NHL right now yeah. and you are playing against Connor Bedard, yeah. are, is, are you chirping that? Not really. No. I don't really think it has legs. Like, what? Do you, it, it's not a factual thing. So, oh, hey, where's your mom? Oh, good one. Right. Good one. <laughs> right. Right. Good one. Like, what do you, like, if I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut deeper than that. Right. Right. That makes sense. But yeah. that's one of the things that I thought about. Like, it, I was just like, it would be constant. Maybe. No, yeah, never mind. I was going to say, skate over and warm up and hand over like a lipstick and go, like, hey, your mom forgot this at my place last night. <laughs> see, see, now see, that's, that's where I thought that you would go with it originally. But that, it's just, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, maybe. Right? I cannot remember a story this bizarre in the NHL for a while. For so many, I mean, for so many different reasons. But social media, that's why. Absolutely so. So I cannot believe that I'm about to say what I'm about to say to you. I actually expect to get booed a little bit, and that's oh, okay. Wow. I cannot believe that I'm about to say this. Jamie, I am excited to see Patrick Kane play for the Detroit Red Wings. Oh, wow. I, wow. I despise that man. I despise his hey, hair. Hey. I despise... <laughs> Everything about that guy, but him going to Detroit, yeah. being a wing, and then also being on that team with Dylan Larkin and David Perron. And, you know, like, I, I feel like they might have a little something cooking up there. Yeah. So I agree with you. The Chicago Blackhawks version of Patrick Kane is vomit worthy. There's no doubt about it. Yes. Yeah. He was really good and they won a lot of cups and I'm jealous. And they uh, kicked our, I was just tired of seeing them kick our ass. Yeah. That's where the hatred comes from. And he's from. one of the best players to ever play in the NHL. So all of that is certainly reasons to hate. And him. one of the best American born players of all time. Maybe the best. Maybe the best. Maybe the best. I look at it this way. One, the Red Wings are in the Eastern Conference now. So it's not like it used to be. Right. You know, the hatred isn't there anymore. Like we remember way back in the day, but we're not getting that anymore. And we probably never will. Yeah. And so Patrick King going to the Red Wings, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's a good market. You know, uh, Steve Eiserman, I have a ton of ex teammates that are all through the management and coaching staff and all that. And a lot of people still working for the team. That's a team that's been in a rebuild. And so much so that they were really, really bad. Steve Eiserman comes in a couple of years later. They're right now sitting in a, a really prime playoff spot. You bring in now arguably the best American-born player to play alongside all those guys. You said you forgot one guy, Alex Debrinket. Oh, Debrinket, yeah, who Dabrinkit we played had with in 40, Chicago. What forty-some goals playing with Patrick Kane? Whoa. So if you can 
you know, recapture some of that magic in hockey town. It it's an awesome thing. And let's not forget, like for me, the hockey world, the NHL is better when the Red Wings are good. Yeah. It felt weird to have the Red Wings kind of suck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, even though I lost a lot of games to the Red Wings playing with the Blue Note and other teams, but that's what I remember. It's a really good Detroit Red Wings team, the franchise, the ownership, all that. You're like, man, this is a franchise. Yeah. And then you're like, woof, this doesn't feel right. Right, right. I feel like they're headed back at least in the right direction. One of the things that I thought, one of the things I remember you telling me and Jeff about your time in Detroit is how you would be like, getting, you know, uh, getting ready for your morning skate or what have you. And there would be Ted Lindsay in the locker room on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the stationary station, whatever, Treadmill. you know, and, and you ha- seem like you had a lot of those kinds of experiences in Detroit. What was that like for you as a player? And it seems as though the NHL has does such a great job of respecting the generation's before it you know there there is a lot yeah I mean, it, it's not just baloney i mean you guys know that these guys went through the war we respect them for it but can you talk about that and not just play you know alums like i mean these are yeah these are like historical figures in the nhl right it was pretty wild man like i remember being there first of all you walk into a locker room in detroit and you know i don't know the exact count of hall of famers that were on that roster but it's got to be eight to ten hall of famers from that <laughs> one singular roster and to be determined, right? Because Zetterberg and Datsuk haven't had their chance yet and they might get in there. You got to think both of those guys get in, especially Datsuk, right? I, I would think that both of them get in there. Both yeah. of them won Selkie trophies like that. Zetter, like you could have 10 to 11 Hall of Famers from that one roster and Cujo still kind of lingering out there too. And he was on that team. Yeah. So it's already a different animal when you walk in there. You're like, okay, like, I'm looking around the room, and there's some serious freaking players here. So I had to check twice to make sure my gear was still there. <laughs> and that you were in the right spot. <laughs> it's Rivers. Are you sure it's on the list? I said, uh, yeah, you can go sit next to Iserman. I said, okay, good one. Now I know I'm being punked, right? <laughs> right? But no, it was true. I sat next to Stevie in the locker room. Uh, and I remember, like, a week to 10 days in, to come off the ice, and Ted Lindsay's in the weight room working out. Ted Lindsay's an iconic hockey player in the history of the nhl and tough as nails terrible ted Lindsay was his nickname you go over and his face looks like a bowl of mashed potatoes like it's just cut and and like beat up and everything but he's just talking to you like you're one of the guys and i'm kind of geeking out at the time and then you know about a month later you walk in and gordy howe oh he's sitting in the locker room he's just like sitting like three seats away from where i'm getting dressed and what not getting for practice and looking over I'm like there's mr hockey like sitting there i want to like touch him like is this real like, poking, <laughs> right. you know? like how do you dude how when you get traded to a team like that that is already laden with star players and i understand one of the things that you know has become incredibly clear to me as a sports fan is how incredibly important chemistry is in a locker room. So man, when, and you've been traded a bunch, you know, you, Thank you, you, you bounced reminder. around. <laughs> Maybe not the way that I wanted to say it. If you came but... here wanting to hurt me tonight, <laughs> but Joe, man, but, but I think it goes into the question, like you are introducing yourself into a room that's maybe already kind of cohesive. Oh, yeah. How do you do that and not be like, you know, man, how do you just kind of gently get in there? Yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge because, you know, most of the guys that I play against hate my guts. And so that's obviously a difficult thing to walk into a locker room. And even though hockey does a real good job of kind of parking it, you walk in. And, and you know, I remember the first week seeing like guys like Draper and Malby, uh, Darren McCarty, uh, like all these guys. And I'm like, man, I've done some screwed up stuff to these guys over the years. <laughs> and... They're probably not real fond of me, but this is where like the hockey world is great for being a tight knit family is like, I grew up watching Steve Eiserman play. He was like eight years older than me. So you always like, Oh, let's go watch the Eiserman kid. You know, he was awesome player. Then I ended up playing hockey with him in the summers when he'd come back. And so I knew Stevie a little bit for and obviously playing against him for so many years. Uh, Brendan Shanahan was on the team, Brett Hull, Curtis Joseph, a lot of guys that I knew from past teams that I played on, so they made the transition really easy. You know, like and the Red Wings group was such a tight knit group. 
that all of those superstars, it was amazing how they coexisted and nobody cared about like who scored the goal. Mm-hmm. It was never about who scored the goals. How many goals did we win by? And that's a credit to Scotty Bowman. That's a credit to Steve Eiserman. That's a credit to Kenny Holland, like the leadership group that was in place and primarily Mike Illich, the owner, the owner wanted that team to operate as a team and they did. And so the transition to the Red Wings in particular um, was fairly easy yeah. after day one. Yeah. And then you look around and everybody has a role on that team, which I loved. And, and I, I felt like I thrived in that environment in Detroit because I knew what my role was. Yeah. You know, like I, I wasn't out there to score a power play goal. I wasn't there to score 100 points. I was out there to make life miserable for other players. On the other team. We didn't have a lot of guys to do that, which is why I was signed. And so when you know what your role is, it's pretty easy to say, okay, I'm going to go out and play physical against this guy, this guy, this guy. But then the, the kicker for me was when I was told, like, to use your skill. Because the Red Wings were a team that were all about skill at that point. They didn't want to give you the puck back. And I've told this story before, but for maybe people who are listening for the first time, <laughs> it's my very first shift. Nah, one of my first shifts for the Red Wings. I'm playing with Chris Chelios, which is unbelievable. Unbelievable. He passes a puck D to D in the neutral zone. I take like three hard strides and crack, dump it in. Like, yes, solid play. Stay solid play. Feeling good about oh, yeah. yourself. I'm feeling good. Mm. A little jump in my step. But yes. Get to the bench. And I'm sitting there and I can see Holly. And he's kind of leaning forward, looking down, sits back. Leaning forward, looking down the bench, sits back. Finally, he leans forward like a third time. I go, what? What do you want? <laughs> like, what? He goes, this is Detroit. We don't dump the puck in. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right. <laughs> so Stevie... Eiserman is sitting like kind of in between us. There's like somebody else who I forget. And Stevie goes, uh, hey, Rivs, yeah, honestly, um, nobody's going to get it. <laughs> he says, you dump the puck in, we're not going to get it. Yeah, I find it so amazing. So they did basically at that point, they like Stevie and Holly and all these like Hall of Famers said, listen, man, you're here because Ken Holland knows you can play the game. Yeah. Yeah, sure, you're here to rough people up and play aggressive and do all that, but you can play the game. You can handle the puck. You can shoot. You can pass. So I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. I get to run around and be a bit of an idiot, and I get to play hockey. <laughs> it was great. It's really remarkable, though, when you think back about that team in particular that you were on and all of those players in which that you that that you had the opportunity to play with. I think another thing that I loved hearing you talk about, and I haven't, I haven't asked you about it in a minute, was that you have – Nothing, obviously, the highest respect for Wayne Gretzky, oh, yeah. your guy, but playing for him was not particularly like the easiest thing, correct? Oh, no, I disagree. It was easy. Oh, for, for me, it was awesome. It was easy for you. It was awesome for Because me. you were already friends with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, it was an awkward situation. Not awkward. It was uh, things didn't work out with me ultimately in Detroit. I wasn't a very big Mike Babcock fan. Years later kind of indicated on that one, just <laughs> sure. saying. Um, but I got traded to the Phoenix Coyotes at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, the Arizona Coyotes. And Wayne Gretzky was the head coach there. And you get there, and you're not really sure you know, what their plan is for you. And I know I, I knew I needed to play because my contract was up. I was going to be in a UFA, and I barely played in Detroit under Babcock because, you know, it's Mike Babcock. Anyways, mm -hmm. so... When I got there, I played a couple of games, and then Gretz comes up to me and he says, hey, listen, man, got to make sure that you're, like, airtight, like, off the ice, stay in shape, you know, this and that. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, I get it. I'm like, I'm not really boozing. Like, I don't you know. <laughs> right. He's like, no, man, he's like, you're going to play a lot of hard minutes here. I'm going to lean on you to, you know, help with the young group at the time. Like, they had Keith Ballard. Mikhailik was a young defenseman there. And I was partnered with Mikhailik and – you know, Gretz wanted me to really kind of show him how to be an NHLer, and how do you do that if you're going to play seven, eight minutes and be a donkey? Well, yeah. you can't, right? So my minutes increased to 18 to 20 minutes a game, playing regular shift, second power play unit, first penalty kill, blocking shots, doing all that stuff. It, but it was because of Wayne Gretzky, and Gretz just said, "You're going to play a ton. I need you to play good. I need you to keep your act together, like on and off the ice." and 
that's that. You yeah. want another contract, that's how you get it. And so it was great. I absolutely loved playing for Gretz. There were times we'd have some funny times on the plane, uh, funny times at like the bar away from the team where he's just like trying to figure life out as far as a coach. Because he kept, he, remember this one, I won't name the player because <clears throat> it's irrelevant, but player X, we'll call it, is on the power play and he's just, it ain't working. But he's one of our best players, but it ain't working. And Gretz has got me at the bar that night, and he's like, I just don't understand. How can he not find the guy that's open here? How does he not see the play of all? How does he? He's like, going off. And I go, hey, his last name isn't Gretzky. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me, and he's like, well, like what the? What do, you, what do you mean? I'm like, nobody can see that play <laughs> except for you. I'm like, go back and watch. How the hell do you think he's going to make that play? Right, right. The no look backhand sauce cross ice to a guy for one timer. That ain't happening. Right. We're in last place for a reason because you don't have a Gretzky here. Right. <laughs> but, did, but did he like have the moment where he's like, oh, oh, okay, I guess I get that? I, I, it took him a while. Yeah. They finally came around to it because I kept reinforcing it. Right, right. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, then I'm like, this simplify it then don't ask the kid to do too much like he's unable to do what you're asking because you're expecting it to be you right, right there which i think was the hardest part for for wayne as a coach because obviously he knows the game right to me he's the greatest player that ever lived and it was hard for him to understand how players couldn't see think or play the game the way he did yeah and I could see how that would be very difficult for a guy like that. I personally don't have that problem. <laughs> right. um, but being Wayne Gretzky, I could see, like, why aren't you doing what I would do? Well, right. because you're one of one. Right. I mean, and one. I think that that was the, the biggest probably learning curve for, for Gretz as a head coach was realizing that not everybody was as talented as him. How did you make your way to the KHL? And when did that come about? So I signed with the Montreal Canadiens and Guy Carboneau, who was the head coach of the Montreal Canadiens at the time. We were teammates here in St. Louis. I got to know Carbo very, very well. Uh, he was really tight with Holly. And so anything we would do as a group away from hockey, Carbo and Holly and me and like other guys, it was a whole thing. Uh -huh. And so when he became the head coach of the Montreal Canadiens, it was so weird because guys like me don't get signed on July 1st. Like when free agency opens, there's not a race to sign a depth defense. <laughs> right, sure. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. it's like you wait a, a week to 10 days and then maybe then the phone rings. Sure. Well, my agent, Matt Cater, calls me and goes, uh, I got an offer. I'm like, what? From who? The, the Montreal Canadiens. I love that you didn't believe it. <laughs> well, first of all, I was up in the middle of nowhere at my lake house and we we had one landline between like two places between my parents' place and my place, so it was like awkward to try and get a call as it was. And he says, "I got an offer." I said, "Well, from from who?" I was expecting like a minor league deal, like something like this early. Somebody's just fishing. It was the Montreal Canadiens, and I was like, "Okay, I'm listening." Right. It's a historical franchise. I grew up like loving the Montreal Canadiens. And he says, it's a one-year deal. You know, Guy Carboneau really wants you there and blah, blah, blah. There, you're going to be a six, seven defenseman to just, you know, if there's injuries, you work your way up or whatever. And I was like, that's, but that's where I was in my career at the right. time. Right. So I was like, yeah, I'll take it. Done. Well, there was the GM there, Julian Breezebois, two or three weeks later ends up signing, signing Patrice Breezebois. See what I'm saying? Yep. And um, so Patrice Breezeball was already a Montreal Canadian a long time before. So he wanted to come back and end his career as a Montreal Canadian. Oh, boy. But he wasn't a top six defenseman. So whose spot do you think he took? I believe that was your role, sir. It's my spot. Yep. And I get it. He was there before and, and the connections and all that. It was great for him. Right. And I got to camp and I, I outplayed him. Like, I'm not lying. I outplayed him. I had a really good training camp. I had a good preseason. And then they're like, well, look, we're going to put you on waivers and you'll only be down the mine. If you, if you clear, you'll only be down the minors for probably three weeks or a month, you know, we'll get you back up here. And I was like, nah, I actually said, I'll have to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then I called my agent and I was like, call Russia. I was like, just get me money. 
like my career is over at this point. Sure. I, I'm thinking to myself, my career is over. I signed as a depth guy. They want to send me the minors. It was 30 plus years. I'm like, this is not happening. You know where it's, I mean, you know where it's going. Yeah. I'm not riding 12 to 16 hours on a bus anymore with soggy French fries. Like it ain't happening. And so I had my agent call uh, the, our agency over in Russian. It was the Russian super league at the time. So it had absolutely no rules. Like the KHL is like a very refined version of what I played in. Okay. And so a team in Moscow, Moscow Spartak offered me a contract and the money was like twice as much as what I was going to make in the NHL that year. And so I said, fine, I'm doing it. I'm not going to Hamilton to play for the Bulldogs sure. waiting for a call up. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I'm willing to accept this as my last moment in the NHL. And I'm going to move on and go make as much money as I can playing elsewhere. And that's kind of how it started. And I went over there and, and played for one season, which was enough. Right. It's good with that. You only played there for one season? Mm -hmm. Only one year. Yeah, it so, felt like seven, Donnie. We're right. But but so like at the end of that first season is when you had the incident on ice. No, that was two years later. That was two years later. Okay. Yeah. So how wh wh where are we after this? So then I guess I lost <laughs> I lost track of your career after the KHL. I Me suppose. too. Don't All worry. Right. <laughs> Me too. So I went from the Russian Super League, and at the end of that season, I'd had enough. And, and that's we'll have a podcast. We'll do a podcast one day where we talk about the Russian experience. Okay. Um, and, and there were some really good moments and there were some really trying moments during that year. I just had had enough. The, the way the season ended, I was like, yeah, I'm good. And so oddly enough, then the Atlanta Thrashers end up offering me a contract. Huh? I know it was crazy. All right. So I report to Atlanta Thrashers training camp, which I was like, why the hell? Like, but they were in the same position where, they had a young group of players, and they wanted a veteran guy kind of around and whatnot. Now, they had been very clear with me that I'd probably start the season in the minors and whatnot. And I was fine with that because in the minors, it was the Chicago Wolves were the AHL affiliate. My brother had played for the Chicago Wolves. The ownership there is awesome. And they paid guys like NHL league minimum type salaries to play in the minors. So you're playing in the minors, but you're being compensated at a higher level, sure. which I was okay with. Because um, you got young kiddos at the time? Got young kids. Um, Chicago is a quick drive. You know, it, and that was a veteran guy. It, it just was a, a good. good situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I ended up playing in Chicago that year. I never did get a call up, which I wasn't guaranteed a call up. I knew that, but I made pretty good money. But then the following year, a team in Switzerland called, which is where I wanted to go a long time before, which if we back it up to my last tour duty with the Blues in 06, 07, I had a three-year contract on the table from a team in the Swiss League making like pretty good money. And I passed on that because John Davidson called me and offered me a contract to come back and play for the Blues. All right. In hindsight, I probably should have went to Switzerland when I, at that point because the Blues end up being kind of like my last real stop in the NHL. It was on a one-year deal. But you hang on for dear life. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't ever want to leave the NHL. And had it not been the Blues, I probably would have went to Switzerland. But it was the St. Louis Blues calling me again. I was living here, and it was just like, yeah, I want to be a Blue again. Like, I never wanted to leave to begin with. Right. So for me, I was like, I want to come back home. And I did. And it was a good year. It was fine. We had a bad year as a team. It was a rebuild with starting and all that stuff. But it was really fun to be a Blues player again in St. Louis and, and, and go through that experience. But getting back to Switzerland is years later, team in Switzerland still came back again, offered me a contract. And let me tell you, that's the life. Playing in Switzerland was unbelievable. They paid good money. Not NHL money, but good money. Mm -hmm. They give you a place to live. They gave us a car. They gave me a scooter. Oh, well, that's awesome. Dude, you should have seen this disaster. <laughs> we had a number of guys that had scooters in our little area. Right. And we'd go to the practice rink and we'd use the scooters. And then we'd race back to the apartment <laughs> complex. Of course you would. We were going through people's yards. And I, I mean, the cops hated us for sure. And our cars. Here's the funny thing about the cars. They give you a car over there. But they advertise on the car with your head 
on the side. So on both sides of the vehicle is a giant like <laughs> picture, picture of your face of my mug. <laughs> <laughs> Not just me, but like all the players. So when you're driving around town, everybody knows, oh, there's Rivers. Right, right. There's so-and-so. There's so-and-so. That would be awful if you had a bad game, man. <laughs> uh, but the fans were great. But we had a guy that lived two floors below me, and we never locked our doors because it's Switzerland. Nobody's doing anything wrong there. Right. <laughs> and so I'd go and steal his car keys, and I'd drive around town in his car, and I'd purposely drive like an asshat. <laughs> And people would get all mad and like get super angry. And it's him. And, and it's, it's him. And it was they thought it was him. him. Right, because right. It was Eric Westrom was his name. <laughs> his big mug on the car, driving around like an idiot, just to be a fool. So when did the incident happen? Where? So that was the following year in Croatia. And How did you get to Croatia? That's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting at home. I wanted to sign back in Switzerland, but at the time, the Swiss League only was allowed three import players on each team. And very seldom did they sign a defense when they wanted a goal scorer. You look at the Swiss League even now today, they find all the ex-NHL guys that were goal scorers or guys that never quite made it to the NHL but scored 150 goals in the minors. Yeah. Like, they're just pure goal scorers. That's what they want to sign. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting. I got tired of waiting. And then Ted Sater, who was the assistant coach, my very first go around with was 1993, 94. Ted Sater was an assistant coach to Bob Barry. Well, he was coaching now in the Austrian league. So he called me. So this is how it was worded to me. Jamie, I'm coaching in Austria. I would love to have you come play for me. You know, it's pretty good money. Give you an apartment car, the whole bit. That was always part of the spiel. And uh, I'll even give you a, a bonus, you know, to get you started. And I was like, okay, it's Ted Sater. Like, you know, then as we go through it, I realized that the team that I'm playing on is in Croatia. They play in the Austrian league, but oh. the team is located in Croatia, which let me tell you, certain areas of Croatia were beautiful. Sure. The food was fantastic. Uh, the coastline is beautiful. I was nowhere near that. <laughs> Nowhere near that. <laughs> no, I was in Gotham City where it was just gray and dark and cold. People were still nice. The food was great. Right. No complaints. I mean, you got to you know, count your blessings. And so that's how I ended up in Croatia and was playing really well to start the season, like scoring points every game and like having a good time. Um, it, it was everything was great until, you know, until we had the moment where. So how far into the south. season, take us through this. So how far into the season were you? Tell us, tell us what happened. And if you have not heard this story about Jamie's career, <sighs> it is freaking crazy. Well, this is a long story. Donnie. Is it a long, is it too long for the time in which that we have left? I will give you the can, short. Can we version. do an abridged version? Yeah, we, yeah, can, we can do, do an abridged version of um, the highlights. So it wasn't that long into the season. I think it was like 12 games from what I remember, it's a little foggy, but, but I was playing a lot, playing well, having a great time. And we were down by a goal or two in Slovenia. We were playing a team in Slovenia and I just didn't like them. They're cocky and they're mouthy and I couldn't understand what they're saying. So that was frustrating. <laughs> and so I told my centerman at the time, Greg day was his name. And uh, I said, Hey, lose the face off. And he looked at me like, what the hell do you mean? I go, Lose the face off and then let your guy go. So I've been watching these guys all night. They're going to go D to D to the centerman, and I am going to absolutely pulverize him. And so, sure as all can be, Greg Day loses the face off. It goes right D to left D. And now I'm like a shark in the water. I'm just waiting. As soon as that puck leaves the stick, now I like three hard strides and just crush this guy out cold. Oh, wow. There's video. He's out cold. Like the doctors jump on the ice and all this stuff. And I'm skating around and I thought for sure someone's going to fight me. Nobody fought me. I was like skating around in front of their bench, like waiting. I'm like, I'm in the mood. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm in the mood here. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I think my skates are on time. <laughs> right. Nobody make an eye contact. No, yeah. So I was like, okay, I guess, well, I'm going to bulldog my way through this whole game then at this point. Right. And so we kind of did. We st I think we still end up losing. I don't know. That was a, it's a foggy. But then on the way back, on the bus ride back, um, I started to feel really tired, which is so abnormal for me. Like, usually I'm wired for hours after a game. Hell, I'm still wired for hours after a broadcast sure. these days. And 
So I took a nap as we were headed back to Croatia, which again was out of character. And then at the time, uh, you know, my ex-wife was there with our, our, our kids and they were headed back to St. Louis. So they were, I got to the apartment, loaded up the car with or the truck with all the luggage to the airport, got them settled and they're off and running. I forget exactly what their route was, but it's a long day going from Zagreb, Croatia to St. Louis, Missouri. Sure. So I got back to the apartment and I started to feel tired, really tired and sore. And I was like, ah, got the flu or something. And so I was like, I'll take a nap. I woke up from my nap and I couldn't move. I was in so much pain. I didn't know what was going on. And this is where we'll skip some of the details. Yeah. So the, it is, there is an article in uh, on Google that you can go in and just punch in Jamie Rivers death certificate. Yeah. And it'll give you the whole breakdown of all of it. But essentially, I went from being in a lot of pain to calling a trainer who didn't speak English to going to a hospital where nobody spoke English and hours upon hours went by to find out eventually that my spleen had burst. Whoa. And uh, that I'd been walking around and doing everything since that moment, but, you know, bleeding and whatever internally. And so when they went to do the surgery, you know, I don't remember because I was under and whatnot, but when they cut me open... You know, my blood pressure dropped and I was so depleted from the blood and whatnot that I flatlined. And so from there, you know, th this is all, everything I'm telling you now is based upon the account of what I was told later on by the medical staff, because obviously I'm not able to remember any yeah. of that. But I just remember waking up at one point and the lights are bright above me and I can see people kind of moving around to the side and I like went to get up because I'm like, where the hell am I? And I was worried that like I was in the movie Hostel. Like they were taking my organs sure, and sure. like that. And so I looked up and then I it hurt so much. I was like, oh, blank. And everybody stopped and like ran towards me. And I looked down and I'm cut wide open. Like I'm just like, it's wide open. And so they shoved me back down pull it, stapling me as I'm there. And I'm thinking I'm being attacked at the time. So I'm like trying to defend myself, but I'm still like half out of it, you know, like, holy so God. they zapped me again. And I, I, I was out and when I woke up, I was wrapped up, but I had burn marks on me, but those were from the paddles. I found that out later that they, you know, were trying to like revive me. And so I don't know, that's the very shortened version of it. It's un dude. That's one of the things that's so fascinating about being able to talk to you uh, as as much as we do. Not only about the on ice stuff, but the off ice stuff as well. Because there is so much of this stuff that um, I just have a greater appreciation for the athlete now after talking to you and all of the things that you put your body through, all how difficult it is mentally on top of all of the stuff that surrounds the family. You have made me look at trade deadlines, sports, <laughs> seriously, way different now than I did beforehand because, you know, man, you were there to experience oh, yeah. all of those sorts of things. So the perspective is just so absolutely fantastic. Well, we have just about ran out of time. And uh, I would like to thank everybody that came out today. Absolutely. I would like to thank uh, our good folks over at Twin Peaks for having us. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to take the show out on the road again and do it for the people. We should have a tour. I love like we that. get a T-shirt made and have like locations. A hundred percent. But listen, we we'll do like the three quarter rock sleeve, you know, white sleeve, black shirt. Remember those? What are you, what are you talking about? Like a three quarter length T-shirt? Yeah. Don't oh, you remember those? I like, look, I remember I had one that was Twisted Sister. Oh, dude. I got it at a garage sale. I thought I was the cat's <laughs> meow. I wore that thing for like five days straight after I got it. I think I paid like a dollar fifty for it. And I was like, yeah, we're not going to take it. You got that dollar fifty and then some out of that <laughs> shirt, man. Well, for our dude, Jeff Burton, and our guy, Jamie Rivers, uh, my name is Donnie Fandango. Thank you very much for hanging out with us and doing the Last Minute Blues podcast. As always, we say it at the end, let's go blues.